And uh, today we're finishing up a sermon series uh, get, called Give Up Your Skepticism for Lent, where we've been speaking to the skeptic, to the atheist, to the agnostic about a reasonable faith. And uh, in closing this series today, I was thinking about the Batman vs. Superman movie where Lex Luthor says these words that so many skeptics have regarding the idea of a loving God. Luther exclaims, if God is good, he is not all-powerful. If he's all-powerful, he is not good. You know, one of the greatest challenges that comes against the Christian faith is that if God is loving and powerful, why is there so much suffering in the world? I mean, if he's loving, there wouldn't be suffering. And if he's all-powerful, he would just eliminate suffering. And there is suffering, therefore God can't be good or... um, if he's all-powerful, he's, he's not good. So I want to kind of speak to that argument that's presented by so many skeptics and atheists to the faith in closing. And if you haven't been a part of this series, I encourage you to go back and look at some of the other sermons where we talk about everything from um, intelligent design and science to archaeology for the Bible and things of that nature. But today we're going to really focus in on the idea that if God is good and powerful, then how can there be pain in this world. And I want to read from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6 today, and verses 18 through 20, to kind of speak to the biblical worldview of how God is both good and powerful, and yet there is a world in which he has allowed for suffering to happen. Here we read, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, he says, Paul, a servant of God, and he says literally there, a slave in the Greek, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And I've I've been called by him to be an apostle, which just means I've been sent by him. And I've been sent and set apart for his good news. That's what he called me to. He called me to receive his good news of the forgiveness of sin, that he is a risen savior, that he came to rescue the world, and now he sent me on a mission to spread that good news of who he is. This gospel is something that he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It's been prophesied about all through the Old Testament that he would be coming. Verse 3, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, whose throne was to go on forever as prophesied in Samuel through Jesus, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power as shown by his resurrection from the dead. He is the Lord. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and many people will point out the fact that Paul is quoting an ancient creed here that popped up very early on in the churches of who he was, that it, it attests to the fact that he was looked at as God, that he indeed rose from the grave within 15 to 30 years of that resurrection where all the eyewitnesses would have still been alive. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship to call all people, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well, to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to him, to come and belong to Jesus like I do. He goes on then in verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who don't come to him, who instead suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain or evident to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made, so that people are without excuse to reject this God. You know, we cannot pick up a history book, you cannot turn on the news without seeing clearly the depravity of of man and his nature. That man is continually about money, sex, and power at cost to other people. And from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, Paul is going to talk about the sinfulness of all of humanity. He's going to diagnose this as heart sick for the purpose of turning to God for healing. He's going to throw us all in the same camp as people who are depraved by nature, who need God's healing grace at work in order to be made right with him as a gift that he provides. In the words of Warren Wearsby in his uh, Bible exposition commentary, the Bible's worldview is not that human can- man, or humankind started low and ended up evolving high, but rather 
the Bible teaches this de-evolution in which humankind started high in the image of God and then devolved into something low because of sin, where we have become very carnal, living out of our lower base instincts, very animalistic in nature instead of divine in nature. And so God, who knew no sin, became like us and became sin that we might become like him, the righteousness of God. This is the basic concept that the Bible brings And so I want to work backwards through this passage in Romans today to talk about God's goodness and his power that atheists claim can't go hand in hand with the suffering of this world. The Apostle Paul says again in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. It's being revealed right now. We know there's a judgment to come, but God is already at work in his judgments on the earth right now, Paul says. And I want to speak from this idea of God's judgment as to how God is both good and powerful. There's a passage in the Old Testament about God's act of judgment against the Canaanites that skeptics and atheists love to point out as a reason God is not good. To speak to this judgment that Paul is getting, and I just want to use this Old Testament example, and and it's an example that atheists and skeptics love. Because in this passage in the Old Testament, God calls the Israelites to eliminate the Canaanites. And, it, and therefore, what the atheist and skeptic says is, you see, God is not loving. He's like a monster that he would call for genocide and they call his character into question. They call God, the God of Israel, a moral monster. And with this in mind, I think the atheist needs to be asked some very important questions about what their worldview is and not allow us to get completely on the defensive. So I put on the overhead some questions that we should ask the skeptic for them to consider with something of this nature about God's judgment, showing he is all-powerful and sovereign, and how it actually can show his goodness. So first of all, for the skeptic, the question is, if there is no God, then why is any atrocity wrong to begin with? Right? If atheistic naturalism is true, then there is no free will. We're just automatons. You know, it's a dog-eat-dog world. And just by atheism's definition, there is no point to life. And Hitler's Holocaust and things of uh, the Canaanite genocide really isn't a problem. In fact, it makes sense because we're just physics and chemistry doing its thing. We're just matter in motion. We've just evolved. And the strong eat the weak. And so, first of all, why are you upset by this? Your worldview says that this isn't even wrong. You can't by nature say it's wrong. Because to say something is wrong is to say something is right, which you need a transcendent, objective, moral compass to look to, such as God, to even discern between right and wrong. So you're violating your own worldview just by pointing out that it's wrong. Frank Turek here says this. He says, atheists steal from God to argue against him. You have, to, you have to actually look to a moral being to come against this moral being. Second question that we should ask is, is this judgment of God as seen in the Canaanite story, was it just arbitrary? Was God, is God just like a bully, this cosmic bully? Is just, you know what, I'm just going to eliminate this people for no cause. I just am in a bad mood today, and I'm just going to zap them like Zeus. Is that what we're supposed to say? No, of course, we never... St- step back and ask the atheist, do you even, have you read this and do you have any context for what you're saying? You see, what we learn about this story is the Bible is clear that God was very long suffering with the Canaanites. He, he put up with their sin for over 400 years before bringing this judgment against them through Israel. And when you look at the heinousness of their, their, their sin, what we understand they were doing is they were murdering their children on the molten hot statue of their false god, Molech. They had the statue of Molech. They were setting babies on that were burning them to death as, as an act of worship. And the Greek white writer, Plutarch, writes about this, and he says that there would be drumming in the town to overwhelm the voice of the baby's cries so the parents couldn't hear it because it was so torturous and evil. So atheists, here's what they'll do. They'll complain that God doesn't stop evil. If God is good, why doesn't he stop evil? Here we have an example of God stopping evil, and they're complaining against God for stopping it. 
God brings judgment, but he's long-suffering. He wants repentance. He wants them to come to understanding. Only God knows the human heart when it's beyond being able to be repaired. And so, in my estimation of knowing the God of the Bible, God was long-suffering, wanting them to come to repentance like he did at Nineveh with Jonah, when he sent Jonah, because here was another evil city and people that he wanted to come to salvation. In that case, he knew that they would come. Their hearts weren't so hardened. In this case, we see a case where, in all likelihood, their hearts were so hardened against God that God finally, after 400 years of putting up with their sin upon sin upon sin, brings judgment. It's ironic then that the atheist, the skeptic, would complain against God. Where is God? Isn't he sovereign? Isn't he supposed to be at work in the world? Yeah, he brings work in the world, but he's long-suffering as well. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He loves people. He wants them to come to repentance and understand that he is the one true God, the wickedness of the ways. He acts in this story, and they hold it against him. Is God... Also, the next question we should ask is, is God committing murder by ending lives on earth when he does bring judgment? Of course, the answer is no. He is the creator of life, and he can resurrect it again. You know, when we, if, if Christianity is true, we believe in eternal life. We believe that this is just like a blink of an eye compared to eternity. It goes on forever. And so when you understand this perspective that God is outside of time, and he's calling us unto eternal life, that it, it certainly changes the paradigm shift of when life is taken from people. And that God understands that he can resurrect it and bring it, eternal life to it in the case of the innocent. We also see things from God's control when it comes to his judgments that are at work even now on the earth in our lives, in the lives of nations around us. We see in Jesus him saying things like this in Luke 13, 34, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those that I sent to you to intercede on your behalf. That God is at work in love trying to warn people, trying to get people to himself. You know, I look at, at something like COVID-19 that can shut the whole world down overnight as one of God's sobering reminders of how fragile life is to wake people up to their need for God, for their need to consider eternal matters. They, they, there's certainly different lens you can look through, but one of the things that God uses, though not always the cause, is to sober people to the reality that, listen, life is fragile, and today is a gift. Don't take it for granted. Get right with God today. And here with Jerusalem, he brings warning to them for all their wicked ways. And he says, I longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks to protect you, but you chose to resist me and reject me. That wasn't my choice, that was your choice. And we see the God of the Bible, both a loving and active, powerful and good, working this paradox of tension between judgment and love. I don't know anybody here and I don't know any skeptic or atheist I've ever met that's against judgment, right? People, if you steal from me, if you smack me upside the head, man, I want vengeance. I want justice for you. But I want mercy for me, right? But when it comes to God being a God of justice, so many skeptics and atheists have a problem with that. And they'll accuse him of not being at work in the world, but clearly he is at work in the world, but he's not at work in the world the way that we would be at work in the world, thank God, because we are, tend to be people with snap judgments that are fickle, that would just be smoting everyone all the time. But Jesus is love, and it love drives all of his judgments, and he's merciful, and he's long-suffering, and he's patient, which shows his all-powerful and loving nature combined. So ironically, the very thing of judgment like this, the atheists are against, actually show this often uh, brought up point of if God is love, then he can't be all-powerful, all and if God is all-powerful, then he can't be love. Further point, God's judgment assumes here, and his judgment's clear throughout the Bible and all of human history that he's at work, including with Jesus, who's calling judgment, in fact, Jesus prophesied judgment in A.D. 70 before his crucifixion that would come on Jerusalem because they resisted his protection. They didn't receive him into their lives. So he turns them over to the principalities and powers of darkness. That 
that this by nature reveals that God gives free will. Now, by nature of free will, we have, to, we have to ask ourselves, well, why would God even allow that? Why would God allow free will with all the pain that it brings? Well, if God is love, then certainly love requires a choice. God doesn't want just a bunch of automatons walking around being forced against their will to do things they don't want to do. Because by nature, that is not love. And so if there's going to be love, there has to be free will. And if there's free will, then for free will to be free, by nature of it, it requires God to allow people to choose against him and against his will. And so when the skeptic and the atheist, they cry out against all the, the wrong in the world, they are first of all saying, they're borrowing from God to accuse him of wrong. It's like, well, who are you to say there's wrong in the world? Everything's just subjective to you. Why is it wrong? I mean, there's no God, there's no purpose, there's no meaning, it's just an accident, we don't have free will. By nature of your worldview, it's not wrong. You can't say anything's wrong. So first of all, why is it wrong? Second of all, if God is love, then God in his sovereignty has chosen to allow for us to choose against him, which causes a lot of this pain so once again when speaking to the atheist to the skeptic really it's important for them to consider what their own real world view requires which is an inferior race versus a superior race the strong eating the weak and and terrifyingly so when we look at the 20th century of, of characters like Mao and Stalin Hitler they spoke in those terms and today we see even in russia with putin for the first time i just heard this recently him talking about the superior race and the inferior race that is what is natural mindset to atheistic macro evolution and so we all then want god's judgment to come <laughs> and god's judgment is coming but in his love, he's also wanting to be patient and long-suffering because he has an eternal perspective and he doesn't want anybody to perish apart from him. And so my point is not to answer all the difficult questions in life perfectly, but to show that our faith, our worldview, it's reasonable. It's more reasonable than the atheistic, skeptic worldview. We, we can't figure out God. God, if we're trying to put God in a box and say, I got you figured out, then he's not God. But we can use the mind that he gave us of reason and logic to show that we have a reasonable faith. And in fact, to set yourself against him is to have more faith than the Christian worldview. So I want to cover a couple more things that oftentimes we never consider when it comes to this idea of judgment. Because when we talk about God's judgment and the wrath of God that Paul is speaking about here, there is this continual thread throughout the New Testament, this idea of God turning us over. God turning us over to what we really want other than him and his will and his protection. And that within the laws of his creation, there are certain things we're going to reap that you reap what you sow, that God will not be mocked, that if you want to go your own way and play your own God and violate his principles, there are negative things that come against you, that come with that, that grieve God, that keeps him like the prodigal son waiting for you to come back from the mud pen that you're, you're bound to find yourself in. And so let's just talk about this idea of the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the suffering of God that so many people struggle with. Well, if God is love, then how can this be? So I, I, I got this from apologist Tim Stratton, freethinkingministries.com. You can go there for some great articles for you who are looking for good stuff. Wow, the Lord just put me to the test. <laughs> I'm going to use the overhead, which is perfect. So, oh, thank you, Troy. Wow, look at you. So first of all, suffering whether it be moral evil that leads to suffering or natural evil that leads to suffering or gratuitous evil that leads to suffering, it always points us to the, thing, to the way things ought to be. 
One of the things that is a gift in disguise when you get on the other side of suffering, and nobody wants suffering. And by the way, the Apostle Paul himself said at times in his ministry that he dreaded life itself. He didn't want to continue on. He just wanted to go home to be with Jesus. Life, suffering is going to come in this life because it's a fallen world. And the whole Christian message is that God is restoring the world, that God is going to bring good back, that this is not our home, that this is not where our hope is, that we're longing for a new world, that Jesus has his way in. But in the meantime, what suffering often does for us is it reminds us, first of all, this isn't our home, that we shouldn't get too comfortable here, and it reminds us that, man, life shouldn't be this way. This isn't right. It's wrong when you, when you go to a funeral and you see people weeping. It's unnatural. We just intrinsically know, and Paul says this in Romans 1. He says, God has made it clear this isn't right. I'm not right. This world isn't right. And suffering has a way of reorienting us back to God to recognize, wait a second, this can't be right, and, and i got to find something more than this than just live for this world. And that's important because what we find is that it's, it's often the number one way people get to Christ. When you're in ministry and you talk to people, you say, how did you get to come to Christ? It was usually a time of crisis, a time of suffering that got them into eternity where there's no more suffering to come. The second thing to consider that we often don't is the fact that Adam and Eve, this satanic figure, which not, isn't even a proper name, by the way, this Diablos, this rebellious figure, this evil, fallen angels, in other words, they had these suffering-free states of affairs that they took for granted, and they freely chose to wreck it. And, and what that can speak to us again is that there is something about the human experience that we're all inspired by that comes through loss, through failure, through suffering, that puts something deep, substance-wise, a depth within us of endurance and character and strength to not take things for granted. You know, I think it was Thomas Edison, and, and I, you got to be careful. You can read too much into this with people's different stories, and I apologize if I come off offensive in any way. I know these are complex issues. But I think it was Thomas Edison that said, the best thing that could happen to a child is that they're born into poverty. And what he meant by that is there's something about the human experience that when you're born into riches, you take it for granted, and your depth of character is not developed. You don't end up often having a work ethic. You, you get spoiled, and, you, and you're not very pleasant to be around. You feel entitled all the time. But when people have to work their way up from the bottom to the top, and they have to earn it, and they have to learn good character development, and, and um, they got to learn how to work hard, there's something so respectable, and there's so much dignity in that. And, and, and sometimes the, the best thing that can happen is to not have everything just hand to us on a silver platter. You know, people don't talk about, like, the GOAT. We talk about the GOAT, the greatest of all time. You know, a lot of people don't know that somebody like Michael Jordan, he missed, like, 65% of the last shots he took. He missed. But there was just this nature in him that wanted it and that just kept going and kept taking the last shot anyways and we remember all the wins you'll get somebody like babe ruth you know you think about babe ruth you think oh this amazing home run hitter he had more strikeouts than anybody in the history of major league baseball but he kept on swinging and he kept on swinging and he kept on swinging and he ends up hitting home runs you know there's something that is admirable about that there's something in us that when we go through hardship, it creates a depth and a, and a rootedness in Christ and a drive and, and a respectability and a sympathy and a compassion and a well-roundedness that we can't necessarily fully understand, but we catch glimpses of the wisdom of God in allowing the world to go ahead and create the world in a world that he knew would create a lot of hardship. So finally, I, to, to the final point there from this website, that was a good point. If we ultimately get to Christ and suffering and trials ultimately lead us there, then isn't it worth it in the end? I, like I said, this doesn't answer all the questions I'm trying to. I'm just trying to show the reasonableness and thoughtfulness of faith. 
as opposed to atheism, where there's no point, there's no definition, there's no purpose, there's no hope, there's no light. And you can't even say that something like genocide, rape, slavery, racism, starvation is wrong to begin with. Because it violates your own worldview. J.A. Freud was a great 19th century historian who said this, one lesson and one lesson only, history may be said to repeat with distinctiveness, is that the world is built somehow on moral foundation and that in the long run it is well with the good and in the long run it will be ill with the wicked. You just can't get away from what God has made evident. You break the laws of agriculture, your harvest fails. You break the laws of architecture, the building collapses. You break the laws of health, your body fails. God has made it plain to us through our conscience, through the way life operates. There's laws of nature that show order, morality, a transcendent cause, an objective moral standard that we are to live to, It is evident, and you have to suppress it, and you have to reject it. And the root issue is that you want to be your own God, and you don't want to accept Jesus. And what I want to bring to you is that the reason the Apostle Paul opens this letter, back in verse 1, calling himself a willing slave of Christ, is because when you see the true Christ, you see the wisdom of God in his teaching, You see the mind of Christ. You see the heart of Christ. You see the love of Christ that's willing to enter into our suffering and have the the darkness and the principalities and powers exhaust themselves on him on that cross, somehow taking that judgment upon himself so that we don't have to take it, so that we could be free, so that, see, he conquered the final enemy we have in death to give us the hope of eternal life, to know we're going to have, when you finally see it, you too would willingly give yourself as a slave of Christ. You too would say, there's no better place to give my allegiance. Who else would I, I don't want to lead myself in this world. Nobody loves me anymore. Nobody has greater wisdom. Nobody has greater power. Nobody knows better in Christ and so Paul introduces himself hey I'm Paul you want to know about me here's the first thing you need to know about me I'm a willing slave to Jesus that's who I belong to that's where my allegiance lies I've lost everything to know him more because nobody loves me more and nobody's shown me more about hope and the eternal kingdom to come is that your testimony today as I was thinking about wrapping this sermon up, I thought about Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 26. What good is it for someone to gain the, the whole world, all the money, all the power, all the sex that this world is chasing after? What good is it to attain all of that in the doggy dog world and stomp on others to get there and lose your soul for all of eternity? God is good, and he is all-powerful. And every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You can trust him, and if you seek him, he promises you will find him, and you will become a citizen of a new world order that's coming under King Jesus, where all the pain and suffering and sorrow is going to be eliminated. And the only reason it's not here yet is because he's in control and because he's so loving and he doesn't want to see anybody perish apart from him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would just trust in him, put their confidence in him, they could have eternal life forever in his kingdom. Listen to me. Jesus, as we were singing that last song, his name is light, his name is life, his name is power to tear down every stronghold in your life. Paul says, I was called as his servant, as his willing servant, to talk about the obedience of faith. Faith brings obedience. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ and his power, his resurrection power, that's where freedom comes. That's where I become an overcomer. I stop putting my faith in myself, in my wisdom, in my orientation, in my direction. I put my faith fully in him to lead me. 
That's when I experienced the power of God, the resurrection power of life, God, to make me a new creation. So I'll just close with this thought. Rome was the greatest city in the world at the time the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, and it was home to the most powerful man in the world, the Caesar. You know what Caesar's official title was? Son of God. Paul comes to Rome, and he says, let me tell you about the true son of God. He's not a tyrant like this. You know what? This tyrant, the worst he can do to you is kill you, and God, the true son of God, took care of death. You don't have to fear this tyrant because this tyrant it doesn't have the final say. He doesn't have the final word. Jesus has the final say. Jesus has the final word, and in his kingdom, there is peace and rest on earth. Good news for everyone who accepts Jesus as Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning once again in Jesus' name. And we thank you so much for your revelation in our lives of who you are. We thank you for how you used our shortcomings, our sins, some judgments, some pain in our lives often to get us to yourself. And while, Lord, none of us would sign up for it, we look at what it's brought to us and the rich reward that comes in Christ. And we just want to thank you for your sovereign grace in our life. We thank you for we who can see with spiritual eyes that you've opened the eyes of our heart to see your love, your goodness, your all-powerful, and your all-loving. And how you hold that tension together in a world that, Lord, we often, out of malice, want to see your judgment come. And we say, Lord Jesus, would you please forgive us and help us to love our enemies? Would you give us your heart for this world that's willing to die for it because it's so assured of where it's going to end and where we're going? And so God, help us to live in light of eternity and help us bring mercy and love and kindness and joy and peace everywhere we go, everywhere we interact. Help us to bring your kingdom to the earth and show what it means that Jesus is Lord with our lives. We want to be bold for you, Lord. We want to be witnesses in our words, in our attitude, in our actions. And we want to let people know there's hope. There's hope. That repentance brings freedom. That repentance brings new life. It doesn't have to end in judgment. It can end with grace and mercy and new creation. And so, Lord, would you just use this series to help the skeptics in our lives? Would you take, Holy Spirit, any seeds that were planted in conversation? Help us, Lord, to spread, tear down the strongholds of Satan in people's minds and hearts and take every thought captive unto you, Lord, to show people the wisdom of God, the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for residing with us, for going before us. Help us, Lord, just to stay in step with your Holy Spirit today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.